What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Savitech once again, and after a long 10-hour live stream marathon, I'm back today with the results of all of the benchmarking we performed. We're going to rattle off a lot of numbers and go over all of the details for the Ryzen 5 2400G. Stick around. <laughs> start things off, I did purchase this from Amazon on February 2nd and they shipped it to me and it came in early on Saturday. So I do realize that there was an embargo for reviewers, however I wasn't uh, signed to that embargo or anything like that. And this is going to be an actual retail version of this chip. So unboxing it you'll find that it actually doesn't come with the rumored Spire cooler, however it comes with the Stealth cooler which is the lower end AMD Stealth cooler. No real problems here. The only negative or downside here is going to be that it has an aluminum core and not the copper core like the Spire. So other than that, you just are going to get the chip itself along with a sticker and then it was time to get benching. So previously in a video that I'll link up here, I had already gone ahead and updated the BIOS for this Fatality AB350 motherboard from ASRock to P4.4. You can learn how to do that and see the process in the video that I just linked, so go check that out if you're interested in that in particular. Now I'm gonna be rattling off a whole bunch of numbers and I realize that I'm not gonna go through a 10 hour live stream and clip all of the actual footage. So if you wanna check out the footage, we do have timestamps up on there for each individual game and we will have that linked in the description for you guys to go check out. But without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about the numbers here. We started things off a little rough because of drivers and it did get a little bit more cleared up near the end. So we were still able to get a pretty good idea of performance. However, this will change with release date drivers, which will be coming out tomorrow. And I'll do an update video, of course, once we have our hands on them. But starting things off with Cinebench R15, multi-threaded at stock clocks, it was 769. Now this is with memory at 2666 megahertz. And as you can see, it's the Crucial Ballistic Sport, and that'll be linked in the description for you guys. Uh, I did try two other sticks, and neither one worked, the Corsair a Dominator Platinum and the HyperX Savage, neither one of those sticks would even boot. The system would go into a boot loop and we would get no post at all. So heads up on that, uh, just typical Ryzen memory compatibility issues, nothing too surprising there. On Cinebench single threaded, we had a score of 149, which is pretty good. That's all at stock clocks. And then getting into some synthetic benchmarks, Firestrike was a score of 3,042 total system, of course, and Time Spy was 1,141. The Superposition 1080p medium benchmark scored 2,292, and the Cinebench R15 OpenGL scored 39.74 FPS. The final benchmark here was the user benchmark on the website, and it essentially got the basic scores of gaming for RAF, it got a battleship for desktop, and it got a gunboat for workstation. I'll try to link, of course, the benchmark details in the description below as well. Now moving on to mining with the CPU, it was actually quite disappointing as opposed to with the 1800X and 1700, etc., where there's enough cash to handle it. This is very cash limited, and going over two cores pretty much stops it and degrades the hash performance. So as soon as we hit like three cores, it cut the hash performance per core in half. And then once we went ahead and tried to do all four cores, it cut the performance per core by about 60%. So each single core is still the same as any other Ryzen. You're gonna be having the 75 hash about per, per core. The caveat to that for this particular processor is that as soon as you try to go with more than two cores, it starts kind of knocking that performance level down. So you're not gonna be seeing anything great for mining here. We didn't check the GPU for mining because we were having some issues with drivers, etc., and we wanted to move on to some gaming. So let's talk about real world gaming. So starting things off, we have GTA 5 on normal settings, and it was at 29 FPS for the minimum, 65.8 for the average, and 135 for the max. 
On high with GTA 5, we had some pretty bad mins at 7 FPS with an average of 48.6 and a max of 88.7. GTA 5 was, looks very playable and was pretty smooth during the whole experience, so I have no, no qualms with saying that yes, we're able to play GTA 5 here. Moving on to Rise of the Tomb Raider, it had a minimum of 7.9 FPS on the geothermal portion of the benchmark with an average overall of 32.6 FPS and on Mountain Peak it had its high with 86.12 FPS. Moving on to Overwatch, we have medium settings at 1080p and we were looking at 60 to 70 FPS and the play was very, very smooth and this was true resolution. So we finally do have an eSports title here. Of course, they are a little less demanding, but nevertheless, this is one of the more demanding FPSs, I guess, in the eSports realm. So it's pretty impressive that we got a really, really well playable title here. That doesn't quite continue with PUBG, unfortunately, which I was kind of expecting just because PUBG, as you guys know, already has some issues with AMD optimization as well as just optimization in general. And when we were trying to play at 1080p, we were sitting between like 20 and 30 FPS with frequent stuttering and it wasn't smooth at all. Bumping that down to 720p very low settings, we got a much more playable frame rate. However, there was still some hitching going on just depending on when it was trying to pop in textures and draw distance, etc. Now, another eSports title is going to be CSGO, and we are looking at 70 to 100 FPS in the benchmark. I was trying to pull the benchmark file, but all of this was done live, and I do apologize for not getting all of the exact numbers. We're going to wait probably, of course, for the official drivers to get the, the full numbers here. But CSGO is very playable and smooth throughout. I don't see that this is going to be a problem on this particular APU. So eSports for sure is going to be fantastic. Rocket League as well with the 1080p default settings. And I apologize, I completely derped and didn't actually pop in and check the settings. I went with whatever it booted up as and it was between 40 and 50 FPS, sometimes dipping down into the 30s, but nothing noticeable and as it was very smooth and there's no hitching or anything going on. And then Diablo 3 was one that I had a lot of issues with. It really wouldn't run like I wanted it to. At 1080p high, it would try to eke out some crazy performance up there in the 70s, but it would frequently dive down below 30 and you would get some hitching and some problems, etc. Now, Diablo has always been one of those that you have to tweak a lot of settings on, so I would have to actually sit down and mess with it a little bit more before we could really give a final verdict on it, and I have a feeling it'll probably end up playing pretty well, at least if we jump down to like 900p. In Killing Floor with 1080p high settings, we had a 30 to 50 FPS and it was smooth and completely playable. We didn't have any crazy hitching or weird graphical issues going on with it. So I, I kind of expected it. It is pretty well optimized as well. Uh, Doom, we did test Doom in Vulcan and we got that running after kind of messing with the driver some more, etc. And you were looking at between 30 and 40 FPS, uh, pretty smooth. There wasn't, like I said, any issues with playability there, as expected, because Doom just runs buttery smooth almost all the time, thanks to the developers. Dirt Rally on 1080p medium benchmark had a 57 average FPS. And on the Ultra benchmark, it had 32 average FPS. So that's the racing game for today. And then the Final Fantasy 15 benchmark, which is a, has GIMP works as, as people like to call it, did score pretty impressively with a 3,441. We ran that at 720p light. And that does beat out like the GTX 10, or GTX 650, excuse me and is right up there with kind of what you would expect. It is kind of trading blows as well with the 1030, the GTX 1030, or GT 1030, excuse me. And then finally, the game that I actually ended up playing for quite a while on the live stream, you can check it out, like I said, with the exclamation point in the corner, was actually Dark Souls 3, which played really, really smooth. At 1080p, it did have some drops below 30. This was solved by going to 1600 by 900. And when we did that, we were able to bump textures up to ultra and have a smooth 30 plus FPS gameplay experience. 
which you know is trading blows of course with the original Xbox One and PlayStation 4. And then finally the big question that we had and as you can see I did hook up the kilowatt and we ran Fire Strike. In Fire Strike we saw the total system power draw between 90 and 95 FPS at its max when we were running the combined physics score. Shout out to Keith for making sure that I went ahead and checked it during the physics score. During the actual just GPU test, we are between 90 and 92 FPS. So not too much of a bump uh, going with the combined there. But of course, I believe if I'm not mistaken, that Fire Strike combined score is of course uh, very single threaded. So you could possibly run into some situations where we start seeing a little bit more power consumption if the game is more multi-threaded. So keep all of that in mind. Also keep in mind, this is all very, very early, but we're talking about a system that's less than 100 watts running pretty much any title, including current release AAA titles in a playable fashion. And it should only get better if you can go ahead and update your memory to like a 3200 megahertz. Now about the memory thing, of course, you're gonna be using a portion of your system RAM for the iGPU. So keep in mind that you're probably gonna want to actually bump up to something like 16 gigabytes of memory, which could be a cost factor, especially with the current DRAM pricing. So I do think that's a caveat that needs to be pointed out because if you do bump down to about eight gigabytes, of system memory you're only going to have like an extra six allotted two of that is going to get taken away pretty much by windows 10 and so for your gaming session you're looking at if you went with only eight gigabytes about four gigabytes of memory and that's going to cause you to not be able to play near as many games uh, just from that kind of limitation there so unfortunately that's going to be the cost prohibitive point uh, uh here that you guys need to keep in mind i really want to thank you all for the support on the live stream and i hope you guys enjoyed this video and we covered everything that you guys were curious about in conclusion my thoughts are this the days of the xbox and the ps4 are almost done it looks like they'll be over very shortly especially as this APU technology grows from AMD, which is pretty exciting. However, if you're still looking for a system, it's hard to ignore the fact that the Xbox One X at $500 is a pretty big bang for your buck. And you're going to be able to actually push, you know, 4K textures, etc. And as, as much as I hate to admit it, while it is a cheap solution, you're still looking at $169 for the processor. You're looking at least another $70 for the motherboard. And because of that memory limitation, you're looking at, you know, a pretty hefty $200 price tag on the memory. And so all of that is going to push you very, very close to the, to the Xbox One X. So with all of that in mind, though, do consider that you are going to have a plethora of extra titles. Uh, a lot more free to play titles and you can actually decide where you want to give up the frame rate or the resolution and while the Xbox One X is starting to adopt this a little bit more it's not quite on par with you know the customizability of PC hope you enjoyed I will see you next Tuesday